Good afternoon, everyone, and or, or, or good morning to some. Um, my name's Luciano Della Pozza. I'm the director of the Cancer Centre for Children at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Welcome, everyone, uh, to uh, this advanced therapeutics webinar series where we focus on the rapidly evolving field that is advanced therapeutics. This area is occurring at uh, successive and an alarming rate uh, with innovative and potentially transformational treatments for children both now and, and in future years. But before we get started, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands on which we are all meeting today. This webinar is, is being hosted from the traditional lands of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation in the east and the Paramatical people of the Darug Nation in the west of Sydney. And we pay our respects to elders past and present and acknowledge community members, Aboriginal staff, services and organisations who work closely with us to improve the health and wellbeing of children and young people, their families and communities. If you didn't know, September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. It's a month where we highlight the need to improve the diagnosis, treatment and outcomes uh, for children with cancer and their families. Today's webinar focuses on CAR T-cell therapy, an emerging therapy used to treat malignancies. Now we are joined by a, a panel of local experts uh, who will provide insight on EBV specific T cells, the CAR T cell therapy journey, uh, the EPHA2 parasitic kinase as a targeted sarcoma, and CAR T cell manufacturing requirements. We welcome Dr. Stephen Keogh, Dr. Carolyn Bateman, Dr. Kavi Garishanka, and Dr. Amanda Pan from the Cancer Centre for Children and the Children's Cancer Research Unit at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Following their presentations, uh, our panel will open for discussion. So please submit any questions uh, throughout the webinar via the Q&A tab in the, in the Zoom controls. And if you see a question submitted that you'd like to also have answered, you can upvote the importance of the question by clicking on the thumbs up beside it. Now, let's begin uh, with Dr. Stephen Keogh. Uh, over, over to you, Stephen. Is that green sharing? Sorry. It is now. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Dr. Stephen Keogh. I'm a blood transplant and cellular therapy staff specialist in the oncology department at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Um, my talk today is on the utility of partially matched third-party viral-specific T cells, so more around the supportive care of transplantation. Um, blood marrow transplantation has been performed in uh, children in Sydney for a long period of time. We do, um, across Westmead and Randwick, around 60 transplants per year. Uh, autologous transplants are performed largely for uh, the setting of solid malignancies, largely high-risk neuroblastoma. Amelogenetic transplants, where we use someone else's blood stem cells to replace the patient's hematopoietic stem cell pool, is used for a variety of other purposes. Um, so around about half of the transplants we do are for relapsed refractory leukemia or lymphoma or disease where there is known to be a very high risk of relapse due to chemo resistance. Um, the other half of our transplants are to repair inborn errors of immunity, such as severe combined immune deficiency, whiskered Aldridge syndromes, autoimmune cytopenias. Uh, we also do transplants for inborn errors of metabolism, such as Hurler syndrome, Hunter syndrome, adrenal leukodystrophy, osteopetrosis, and transplant can also be used to cure hemoglobinopathies. Uh, so transplant usually starts with around a week of very high dose chemotherapy, sometimes combined with total body irradiation. And the aim is that that kills off all the rapidly growing cells in the body, including the hematopoietic cell pool. Um, this toxicity of this conditioning therapy causes severe mucositis to respiratory oral gut lining, causes temporary hair loss, skin and organ toxicity. Uh, it's, transplantation needs to be supported with antibiotics, IV nutrition, nasogastric uh, feeding, prophylactic antivirals and antifungals, opiate infusions, and a large multidisciplinary care team. 
each admission for transplant uh, requires the child to be in hospital for two to three months. And there's a prolonged period where they have to stay in isolation following that. And so they're usually not back to school until around six months post-transplant. So obviously following the chemotherapy or radiation, um, patients have no hematopoietic cell production for around two to four weeks. And so are entirely transfusion dependent. Um, during this period of time, obviously there is a significant risk of infection, particularly bacterial sepsis, viral reactivation and fungal disease. And patients are cared for in HEPA filtered positive pressure isolation rooms. Um, viruses are acquired pre-transplantation, um, usually in childhood, are able to reactivate from their white cell pool um, following transplantation. And this risk really goes for about three to four months after the transplant. EBV, CMV, <clears throat> adenovirus, BK virus, HHV6 are particularly problematic following transplantation. Uh, looking at this schema, that's a wide range of infections that children are at risk of after transplant, and the numbers down the bottom are weak. So really the risk goes out to around six months. Uh, these diagrams are particularly looking at um, number A, look at the number of viruses acquired by transplant patients following transplantation. And if you look around 90% of patients get one virus, uh, around 60% get two, 20% get three, and some even get more than that number of viruses during their transplant course. And B, C, and D essentially show that the donor source doesn't really make much difference. So we can reduce the risk of viruses in transplantation to some extent by choosing donors who have had the infection that we want to target. So in other, in other words, for a CMV positive recipient, we choose a CMV positive donor. However, that obviously competes with the other selection criteria for donors, such as HLA match and ABO group. There's a wide range of antivirals we can use to treat different viruses for, and there's a list on the right-hand side of those. Um, EBV is not treated with antivirals, as there is none that are particularly effective, but in EBV reactivation, we ablate the B-cell pool with rituximab. So for, from the point of view of options for patients when they have, CMV, uh, when they have viral reactivation post-transplant, um, in the setting of no cellular immunity, we can passively transfer T cells from someone who has previously had that infection to temporarily control their viral reactivation. Um, options for T cells for transplant donors, uh, sorry, options for T cells can be sourced from potentially the transplant donor, if available, or a third party donor. In Australia, there are three places where we source the cells. Uh, for EBV, there's an open allele study, which is a multinational trial run by Atara Biotherapeutics. Uh, and they have a library of partially HLA matched EBV specific T cells. There's Queensland Institute for Medical Research who currently have a small third party library for multiple different pathogens. And Westmead Institute for Medical Research or Sydney Cell Therapies have a most extensive library of uh, cells against viruses and fungus. Uh, the cells in these libraries are sourced from Australian bone marrow donor registry donors um, who donate at Westmead for recipients all over the world. And at the time of donation, consent is obtained to obtain an extra small amount of stem cells, which feed into the uh, third party library. Just briefly on how the cells are prepared, um, around one by 10 to the nine total nucleated cells are pulsed with peptide antigen for the pathogen you're wanting to target. They're incubated overnight. And then the cells of relevance are selected out and then they are incubated in a bed of cytokines to cause cell proliferation over around a 10 day period of time. Then the cells are frozen in a certain cell number aliquots and quality control is done. The cells are usually ready for release around about a week after the manufacturing is complete. So this is an example of a patient who had severe combined immune deficiency diagnosed on newborn screening. Unfortunately, he acquired CMV from breastfeeding from his mother. Um, he had a brief period of CMV viremia prior to transplantation for which he was treated with antivirals. But as you can see, around two weeks following the transplant procedure, he had a quite high CMV viral load and he was started on gancyclovir. The red arrows with the asterisks depict the infusion of CMV specific T cells, which were manufactured from his donor. And you can see the rapid decrease in viral load and he was able to stop gancyclovir and he hasn't had reactivation since. This is another six-year-old boy who had chronic granulomatous disease and had a transplant complicated by prolonged adenoviral viremia. 
he had weekly sidovavir for a long period of time, but it wasn't until he had the adenoviral uh, third-party CTL that his viral load rapidly went down and he hasn't had viral reactivation since. The response rates to donor-derived T cells, as in that first case, um, from a meta-analysis of 21 published studies, the CR or PR rate is around 76.4%, so they're particularly effective. Um, donor-derived um, matched T cells against viruses can persist in the circulation for around 10 years, and so potentially last a lot longer. Third-party partially matched HLA cells, uh, because they're more mismatched with the donor cells, um, only last a number of weeks, sometimes a couple of months. So there are many options for treating viruses, antivirals, lots of supportive care, et cetera. But in the end, it's incredibly important to repair the immune defect, which this technology obviously does. Um, Looking at this is essentially a schema for if you include uh, cells that are HLA A1 and A2, you can have a bank that covers about 48% of the potential recipients for transplant. Um, if you extend your library to include five HLA types that are common, uh, HLA A2, A1, A24, B7 and B35, you have a potential library that can cover 94% of transplant recipients. Uh, this is uh, a list of all the studies looking at off-the-shelf third-party matched T cells. And down the bottom, it shows that from 17 studies, the CR rate is 64% and the PR rate is 10.7%. So again, particularly effective. But as I mentioned before, the effect is temporary. So this is an example of a nine-year-old girl who had autoimmune disease and developed restrictive cardiomyopathy in February of 2019. She went on to have a cardiac transplant in Melbourne in October 2019. And in August of 2022, developed EBV lymphoproliferative disease. She had nine doses of rituximab and three cycles of chemotherapy and continued on her everolimus immune suppression to prevent cardiac rejection. She had no response to this therapy. And she had multiple lesions in lung and also a new lesion in her adrenal. So that's a picture of her new adrenal lesion that she uh, that developed on chemotherapy. That's a picture of one of the large lung lesions and the green activity on the other side is actually cardiac myocardium and it's normal. So she was referred to third party EBV specific T cells and received four infusions through February to March, 2023. Um, after the first two infusions, she in fact, uh, the adrenal lesion completely disappeared. And by the end of the fourth infusion, she was almost in complete remission. So we gave her one more bag of cells that was around about twice the dose. And from that time, she has been in complete remission. Uh, initially, you can see that her EBV load dropped significantly. Um, but then as she got B cell recovery as a rituximab wore off, her EBV load has gone up again, but she has remained in complete remission from a PTLD point of view. That's the end of my talk. I'd just like to thank uh, Professor David Godlieb and the team at Sydney Cell Therapies, the team I work in, um, WIMA, Westmead Hospital, QIMR, Human Immunology Team, the Avil Study, and the patients and their families. I'd just like to hand over to Caroline Bateman. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Luch, I don't know if you can confirm for me that you can see my first presentation slide. Yes, you can. Speak up. Um, you need to speak you. loudly. Okay, thank you. Um, I will try and speak louder. So um, I'm Caroline Bateman. I work with Stephen. Thank you for your talk, Stephen, at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. I'm a haematologist and an oncologist. And really, I'm doing a segue between the viral specific um, T cells that Stephen was talking about to our own homegrown T cells that Cavi and Amanda will talk about after me. 
So just a, a bit of an introduction is that the concept of harnessing the immune system um, to fight diseases has been described since the development of the first vaccine in the 18th century. And we know that the immune system, the human immune system is efficient to control both infectious and non-infectious diseases. And that T cells can and are classically known to efficiently control tumor cancer development through expression of tumor specific T cell receptors that recognize tumor antigens. And it was in 1980 that the first team really, SHR and team, um, uh, elaborated this concept of redirecting T cells to target antigens of choice by inserting a, a new genetic um, code to be able to develop an antigen or receptor called CAR. And what they did is briefly, they demonstrated that after constructing genomic expression vectors and after transfection into cytotoxic T-cell hybridomas, that they could get a functional antigen-specific TCR detectable. And they were also able to prove that these cells um, grew and, and proliferated and were um, producing IL-2. And the T cells expressing the CAR could ex exhibit a response to the antigen that they designed them against. And, and it also importantly was not MHC restricted. So this is a picture that many of you may be familiar with, which is really where this first car in the 1980s has really moved towards. This picture that you can see on the left here is um, looking at the engagement between T cell and tumor cell using um, the car, which is depicted here in green, engaging with the antigen on the tumor cell seen in yellow. And from the very beginning in 1980s, there's been numerous developments to be able to um, increase the um, engagement of antigen, but also um, improve in the intracellular uh, machinery to allow for expansion and development of CAR T cells. And this really is an image that's to do with one of the first TGA registered CAR Ts in Australia, which is called Tisagen Leclu cell. Uh, its trade name is Kim Wire. It's marketed via Novartis. It targets CD19 for B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And the indication is, is seen there on the slide and still remains as that indication. So this was this CAR T cell, uh, which really was a game changer uh, in the world of CAR T cells, not only in Australia, but uh, throughout the world, was based after the registration trial, which was done by um, colleagues at, uh, in the US at the uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and um, published in the New England Journal of, of 2018. And the, the, the take home message from this picture you can see on the left hand side is that these patients who usually have a very dismal prognosis who relapse post transplant or in second or greater relapse. And many of the patients in the registration trial had many additional lines of therapy. Um, actually were managing to achieve um, an EFS and OS at three months of 73% and at 90% respectively. And you can see that this reduced over time, but the fact that you could get these patients into remission was really uh, an important step forward. But the other thing that was important about this trial was it also demonstrated the successful use of a global supply chain because Kimwire is an autologous product that comes from a patient, is taken to a manufacturing facility, whether that is a, a local facility um, in some parts of the world or a non-local facility, which may mean a long uh, plane journey for these uh, live um, cells from the patient manufactured. And then obviously these cells need to be returned to the patient safely. Um, and that was part of what was demonstrated in this trial. And there's been an update to this trial, which shows, and the number one message from this is that although the remission can still be maintained, is that at a 36-month 36, 36 follow-up is that still uh, the median time of, of um, EFS has not been reached. And you can see that the curve is still going downwards. The main... Um, main message from this publication, which was after patients followed up for three years, was to do with the uh, improved toxicity. We know that these immunotherapies can be potentially toxic, and I'm not going to go into great detail 
of the toxicities, but essentially the toxicities are very immune mediated and are called uh, cytokine release syndrome and a neurological toxicity with the abbreviation of ICANS. And the real world data as people have got used to using these is that we've improved the toxicity where the grade four CRS has gone from being 70% now down to 16%. I think that has been one of the great improvements um, in the therapy. So where are we more now? So Kimri has been around for a while and many centers are using it around the world. Um, although I think for my personal opinion, it most probably hasn't been the panacea that we've all hoped. Um, there are now six with the FDA, so the US um, um, regulatory authorities has six uh, CAR-T that are approved. And in Australia, um, the, um, it's slightly more complex, but um, basically the ones that are approved are Axacel, the top one, and the bottom one, uh, the third one, sorry, Tisogen Leclucel or Kim Meyer. Um, and with the only one for children being uh, tis Tisogen Leclucel Kim Meyer at the moment. But you can see that this is expanding even in a relatively short period of time. So with an excellent CRS rate, C CR rate and an otherwise uh, group of patients with a dismal prognosis, there still remains issues. And these issues are really related to this is a live essentially product that is infused into the patient. And in some patients, they don't seem to be able to have durability or persistence of this cell in the body. And why this is, is not always completely clear, is I've mentioned briefly the side effects and the side effects of um, beef cell aplasia as these um, products um, do target CD19, which are normal B cells. And of course, there's always that overarching long-term survivorship of these cells as they have only really been given for the last decade. So currently going to, in this year, 2023, is how many CAR T cell studies are there? And this was a publication that demonstrated that there were over 850 studies in 25 countries of CAR T cells. Um, and the majority of these are in uh, cancer. And, and, and almost universally, nearly all of them are either in China or USA. But some of these trials are not all cancer trials. Some of them do involve uh, non-malignancies. And I think that's really where um, the really exciting part of CAR T cells is moving into. So this is just to demonstrate not only is it blood cancer, uh, which is uh, B on this diagram, which is uh, deliberately made small so you cannot see all the detail, but it's just to give the idea that A is all solid tumours and that the registered products are almost universally, well, are universally blood cancers, but it's really exciting that similar technology is now being used for solid tumours, for obviously there's still patients who come to the very end of their therapeutic options. So really, I'm just finishing up with my last seven minutes uh, just to report some of the newer things and really how exciting this area is. Is So myasthenia gravis is a uh, debil de debilitating sorry, autoimmune disease that has a pathological lifelong weakness and is, it, is a disease that I have no expertise in. But it is partly mediated by pathogenic plasma cells and the CAR-T technology, which is not the same as the exactly the same as CAR-T technology used for B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, this is RNA based and therefore it's important for these patients who don't have cancer, they don't have chemotherapy and these patients, um, there is no persistence of this type of CAR-T cell so there's multiple infusions. But this recent report that was in um, the Lancet Neurology shows that the 14 participants who got this, it was tolerated very well. They have recurrent infusions and they had um, significant decrease in their myasthenia severity scales. And obviously this is early days for this non-malignant uh, indication, but it really is exciting that potentially there is um, using this technology to make things better for people without cancer. And then um, the, I've demonstrated, I hope, an exciting area for solid tumours, showing you how the number of trials for solid tumours is expanding rapidly and also non-malignant conditions and that cancers that previously difficult to engineer are, are really being treated now by new novel CAR T cells, which use novel engineering 
And I'll just draw your attention to the publication that was in the New England Journal of Medicine in the last week, where T cell, um, CAR T cells for T cell disease has always been very difficult because obviously um, T cells recognize themselves and then destroy the CAR T cell and the T cells, and it all becomes very difficult to control. And the Great Ormond Street group have used based editing to um, manipulate uh, CAR7 T cells and um, that seems to be um, quite successful although very early days and that is where uh, the exciting thing for CAR T cells is is the novel manipulation which is part of the um, development of biotechnology over the years. So that was all I was uh, going to talk about. I'll hand over to Kavi, who's been absolutely central to taking our own CAR T cell that we've developed here at the Children's Hospital Westmead and the Kids Research Centre. Um, but I would like to acknowledge Melissa Gabriel, who is um, supportive and instrumental in taking our new therapies forward, and everyone else um, in the bone marrow transplant and cell therapy group, but also here at the Westmead precinct um, where um, we work closely with the adult haematologists in the viral specific T cell group and also the cell therapy MDT. So thank you very much. I will now hand over to Kavi. Thank you, Kavi. Thank you, Caroline. Let me start with my screen share hopefully everybody can see that okay thanks guys for this opportunity um, my talk is actually going to be on the target antigen which is the FA2 and the FA2 CAR T cells that we have developed here in kids research and CCRU um, so FA2 stands for erythropoietin producing hepatocellular receptor tyrosine kinase class A2 it's basically a receptor tyrosine kinase and it can bind to the efferent ligands. And upon binding of the ligands, especially you can have canonical signaling that can result in cellular adhesion, proliferation, and migration. So it's really an important molecule for normal cellular physiology. Okay, And it plays a really important role in angiogenesis and bone remodeling. It's expressed in really low levels on normal tissues, but quite high levels on tumor cells and tumor, cell, tumor tissues, so making it a really an attractive target. So in cancer, what happens is there is non-canonical signaling as opposed to the regular signaling, which then results in metastasis invasion and tumor progression. And really high levels of FA2 is correlated with poor prognosis and poor survival. Now, FA2 expression is seen on several cancers, um, like adult breast cancer, uh, melanoma, and lung cancer, but it's also seen in several pediatric tumors, solid tumors. Uh, here's an example of immunohistochemical um, staining of FA2 expression on several pediatric cancers done previously at the department by Dr. Federica Saletta. Not only do you see high levels of expression in osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, uh, which is a disease of interest to us, but also in high-grade glioma, which is another cancer that's a focus in our department, but also in medulloblastoma and neuroblastoma. And you can see that there's very little or minimal expression on normal brain, once again, uh, making this quite an attractive target. So there are several strategies to target FA2. Obviously, I'm not going to go into the details of all of this in this talk because this is a separate lecture in itself, but it just suffice to say that um, several of these strategies include, um, ta include ways to promote degradation of FA2 or to decrease the FA2 expression directly. We are, of course, interested in immunotherapy and we are interested in developing CAR T cells. And we've got CAR T cells targeting FA2. So as Caroline mentioned, um, CARs with most of your family are now are chimeric receptors. They're completely synthetic molecules. And they are derived from... Um, a single chain fragment variable from a monoclonal antibody. In this case, the antibody is a, a clone called 4H5 that can target FA2. And this particular SCFV is fused to the signaling domains from a T cell receptor complex to form your CAR molecule. So the original CAR construct was actually provided by Professor Steve Goshoff from St. Jude's and the children's hospital team here has modified that. So obviously you can introduce the CAR DNA into the T cells to let it express to give you your CAR T cells. So there are multiple ways by which you can do that. We are using a lentiviral vector to introduce the CAR DNA into the T cells to generate these CAR T cells. 
So this project was really developed by the previous team at the Advanced Cellular Therapeutics uh, Group here at CCRU, which was led by Dr. Belinda Kramer, Dr. Jeff McAwage, Dr. Kensu, and Shiloh. What they have done is they have um, generated these CAR T cells and showed that it was really effective against um, Ewing sarcoma and osteosarcoma cells in the lab. This is a basic schematic of the CAR and a control CAR um, does not have these signaling domains. So when you, when you introduce this CAR construction into T cells, you can see that there's a robust expression of the CAR T cells. Um, here's just a basic example of your uh, flow cytometry dot plot. On the y-axis is your T cell marker and the x-axis is your CAR expression. And you can see both the control and the CARs expressed really, really well. I'm not going to uh, show all the data from the paper which has been published. Um, this showing effective uh, lysis of both osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma cell lines. But what I wanted to highlight is some murine data in vivo data. Here is an example of um, an intratumoral injection of CAR T cells into murine models. On the left column is a um, osteosarcoma model. On the right column is a Ewing sarcoma model. And on the across the first two uh, plots are showing your tumor volume. And the second two show survival of mice in, day, in days on the x-axis. So I just want to draw your attention to this light gray line here that shows decrease in tumor volume when you have your CAR T cells that correlates really nicely with your increased survival in mice. And what the team has also shown is you can do both intratumoral and intravenous injection as well and have very effective clearance of your tumor. In this case, it's the dark black line that correlates with increased survival. Right, but more importantly, they've also, so the previous one was in just subcutaneous models, but they've shown in uh, metastatic models that you can have the CAR T cells infiltrate very nicely into your lung mets and have corresponding decrease of your lung mets as compared to your control CARs or your control treatment. So this is all really super exciting. Um, this data was then used um, to put in an MRF application. And uh, we're really excited about this MRF funding that we've obtained uh, to start our phase one clinical trial. So what's great about this is that it's going to be a first in human effort to targeting CAR T cells for sarcoma patients anywhere, anywhere in the world, right? And also it's gonna be the first in pediatric. Um, obviously because it's a phase one, um, the primary objective is to evaluate the safety of the CAR T cells. But the secondary objective for us is actually to establish the CAR T manufacturing capacity here at Westmead, because this is going to be a single center children's hospital at Westmead, in-house developed technology and in-house developed um, um, product, which is going to be the clinical CAR T cells for patients. So this is um, kind of a first for, uh, for us in, in, a, in a lot of aspects. So the study design itself has got two cohorts, um, depending on um, the kind of uh, metastatic disease. You can have, uh, we are planning to have one cohort of patients who would receive intratumoral injection of the CAR T cells who have got localized or oligometastatic disease, and um, a second cohort that can receive intravenous injection if the disease is very diffuse. Um, as I said, the feasibility and the safety is a, is a primary endpoint. We are planning to treat um, nine, enroll nine to 12 patients. And um, since the funding has just started, the first year focus is on getting all the ethics applications and governance. And we're just fine tuning the SOPs to put in a, a CTA application to the TGA. We were hoping to get that done end of this year, but we've just been pushed back by a couple of months. Uh, so early next year is um, that's what we're targeting. And we're hoping to start recruiting by late um, next year. So um, I wanted to finish off, but I wanted to highlight that this pipeline that we're developing here at CCRU and the C uh, CHW at Westmead is really a pipeline of local innovation um, translating into patient application, right? It's the quintessential bench to bedside story, bench to bedside research. So the research and innovation, the CAR T cells were developed here at Fitz Research. Now they are being manufactured um, on GMP compliant uh, manner for therapeutic applications, and they're going to go into patients. So obviously this um, particular trial is going to give us a lot of information. We are hoping to get a lot of correlative studies done. So we not only have expertise in cell therapies in our department, but we also have expertise in liquid biopsies, in exome sequencing, in whole genome sequencing, um, 
we've got um, clinicians and um, surgeons who, are, who can resect the tumors. But we also have this 3D modeling that uh, Professor Geraldine O'Neill's group does, which is the 3D tumoroids and spheroids and organoids. So uh, we've, we've had the capacity and the expertise to do a lot of uh, good correlative studies from this trial, which we then hope can go back and feed into research and innovation, obviously, so that we can improve the CAR T cells and um, you know, come up with better next-gen cell therapies. So I'm going to stop there now, and I'll, before handing over to um, uh, Dr. Amanda Tan, who is a senior um, scientist, production scientist, who's developing the CAR T cells for clinical use, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank the cell therapeutics team here at um, CCRU, but literally everybody in the department, including uh, Prof. O'Neill, uh, and also Prof. C. Ian Alexander and his team at the Viral Vector Manufacturing Facility at Westmead, who will be providing the um, uh, viral vectors for this particular trial and the funding agencies. So I'll stop there now and hand over to you. Yep. Oh no. Sorry, I don't. Ugh. Is it sharing or not? Not, not yet, Amanda. Sharing, yes? Not yet. Um, hmm. Starting now. Yep. yep. Great. You're Thanks, Kavi. Apologies. So I'm Dr. Amanda Tan. I'm the production scientist here. And as Kavi has mentioned, I will be um, doing the CAR-T manufacture for our for two cars for our clinical trial one. And I'm just going to briefly talk about the requirements for clinical use and how we are um, attempting to head, uh, meet these challenges. So as Kavi has said, so we need the basic research to identify our new therapeutic targets. And of course, the first aim of our basic research is to evaluate the efficacy of treatment, which we have shown in the in the work that was done by the previous uh, ACT team members. Um, and so our transition from humans to from basic research to humans requires establishing first of all safety. So we can see here in our basic research, we have our preclinical studies and to move on to human transitions in our phase one trials, we need to establish treatment safety before we can move on to establishing safety and efficacy across population. So because patient safety is paramount, the TGA regulates all therapeutic goods. And this regulatory framework is risk-based. So it's the risk versus the benefit. And at all production steps, we must demonstrate that patient safety is, is uh, maximized and we can reduce any possible risk that we, we might introduce to patients without you know eventually compromising the therapeutic good and so to reach this aim compliance to good manufacturing um, practices is core and the two uh, main um, tenets of gmp is quality assurance and quality control to ensure that policies and procedures as well as the product is reviewed to be of the highest standard there are several challenges in clinical production. Um, adaptation of research um, product uh, to GMP compliant manufacture is not always a one-to-one. -one, so we may not be able to directly substitute a GMP compliant material um, with a research uh, with a research um, grade material. Um, and also because everything needs to be GMP compliant, um, the cost of manufacture is quite significant. Uh, aside from the cl clinical production considerations, there are also manufacturing challenges in that CAR-T treatment is generally the last line of treatment. And when we take patient-derived T-cells, the T-cells may have been compromised by previous treatments, such as chemotherapy. So in the future, perhaps patient peripheral blood on the nucleus cells may be collected prior to treatment. And of course, as Kavi has mentioned, we are now... Um, expanding our 
um, expertise here at KR and at, um, the, at the Children's Hospital at Westmead to have the on-site manufacture of our CAR T cells to speed up treatment timeline so there's no need for shipping patient um, uh, cells overseas and then having it be manufactured there and then and having it be shipped back. So, um, and also in the future, we may also see the development of this allergenic CAR T cells for an off-the-shelf solution, <clears throat> sorry, with our effort to CAR. So, <clears throat> key takeaways, this is the first in human effort to CAR T clinical trial with on-site manufacture. <coughs> and um, what we're doing is we're trying to establish the safety of the treatment. And of course, our clinical brain management factor has to be guided by the principle of lowest risk to patients with greatest benefit. And because time to treatment is crucial, being able to manufacture within GMP framework on site is core to delivering safe and efficacious treatment. So the impacts of our e 2 car trials is that we will establish safety of treating solid cancer in children, um, provide access to novel immunotherapy, as well as the validation of the viral vector manufacturing facility here um, on site for clinical application. And so this would build a capacity that can be leveraged to support other early phase cell and gene therapy phase trials. <clears throat> um, I'd just like to acknowledge everyone at CCRU, as well as the viral vector manufacturing facility, as well as our funding bodies, without whom this can't be possible. Um, yeah, thanks. I'll hand back to you. We Uh, look, I'd like to thank all of you. That was a superb set of presentations. Well done. And and, and, and thanks um, again to the individuals who actually submitted some questions. Let me now introduce uh, Dr. Laura Fawcett, who's a um, respiratory consultant, clinical trials, medical lead at Sydney Children's Hospital, Randwick, and uh, Dr. Tabi Traher, staff specialist in paediatric hematology oncology at Kids Cancer Centre at Sydney Children's Hospital, Randwick. And they both will facilitate uh, the question and answer session today. And, and thank you again to the presenter. Really, really good. Thank you. Thanks, Luch. And um, we'll start with um, the first question, um, which I'll probably direct towards uh, Carolyn, um, but um, other people might want to chip in. Um, so in your experience, does CAR, CT, CAR T cell therapy fail? Um, and how do you mitigate that? Uh, yes, in my experience, it does fail, and that is also in the data that I presented. And I think mitigating um, failure really has been part of the journey of the administration of these cells in that it's one to do with patient selection um, at the time that for T cell collection, um, that the T cells aren't too exhausted at the time they're collected. Um, so thinking ahead of time, the dose of the T cells that are collected. Um, and then uh, I think one thing that we have learned over time is the disease status at the time of infusion. And that's related to that bridging chemotherapy that patients have to keep disease under control and really well under control prior to the chemotherapy that's called the depleting chemotherapy before the CAR T cells are infused. Um, and really it becomes down to the mantra of you want the patient in the best condition, clinically in the best condition, disease status, but having significant lymphocyte depleting chemotherapy and bridging chemotherapy, which there is no current standard, um, and then infusing. And then there are things afterwards uh, that most probably can help, but there is definitely still failure um, in and around um, T cell exhaustion. Thanks, Caroline. So I might um, direct the next question, which is really around the approval process to bring CAR T cells uh, into Australia and how difficult is that? So. I think this is probably actually directed to um, all of you, but I might ask um, Steve for you to um, start answering. Uh, sorry, I missed the question. How difficult is the approval process for CAR T cell therapy in Australia? <clears throat> um, probably I'll hand that one over to Caroline actually. 
I mean, the um, the answer is obviously there's there's the approval process for products which are trying for registration, um, and the approval process for products that we're wanting to give in clinical trials. And I think the approval process is as it should be. It's hard. It's difficult. It's robust. It's clear. It's transparent. And um, those are the things that make it difficult. But I think that's what patients want and and should have, which is a clear, safe, transparent process for approval. Um, now, CAVI is is nav navigating the regulatory um, process for our CAR T cell. So, CAVI, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, please. Uh, just to reiterate that it's really hard, <laughs> um, but but you're right. I mean, it, it should be. It shouldn't. It, we should have the checks and balances in place. Um, I just wish it wasn't that hard. Um, but no, you're right. We have to go through a, a because it's ours as a phase one investigator led um, trial, so um, it's quite different from an industry led trial. So it's got its own um, sponsorship applications and um, the local governance and the local ethics committees as well involved. Um, so you add another layer of uh, checks and balances and risk mitigation. Um, so it adds to it. And I suppose the other thing is not just about the approval of the drug. It's one thing we haven't mentioned, and I specifically didn't mention, is the approval to pay for it. Um, because these things are not cheap. Um, <laughs> and that's why I think they are, you know, end of end of. Of, of the patient journey, unfortunately, uh, rather than moving, hopefully moving forward to nearer the front of the patient journey, but there's a su significant financial and resource planning that would need to go into that for the, for the therapies to move forward, meaning move nearer to the beginning of their, their cancer or other journey. Cost is, is, is a significant barrier. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I'm going to address the next question to, to both Kavi and Amanda to start with. Um, so the trial is using lentiviral vectors. Um, is there a likely to be development of different delivery systems in the future? Um, so all the, uh, Caroline, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the clinical trials, I mean, all the cars that have been approved are using lentiviral vectors. Uh, yes, they, that adds significant cost to the car therapy itself. So we have been trying to use non-viral vectors as a mechanism of delivery, but run into some roadblocks. So if we can get the safety path, that would be a good option to reduce cost. Uh, so yes, I see the future where we can have non-lentiviral or non-viral vector, but we're not there yet. So I was going to take the next question, and this is alluded to um, in the talks, the role of autologous versus allergenic uh, CAR-T therapy. So what do you think some of the barriers are about developing off-the-shelf allergenic CAR-T products, say, for cancer therapy? You want me to start with that one, Toby? Um, so I think let's start with the downside of autologous, uh, which I think is sometimes trying to keep disease under control while the patient's um, being manufactured and also T-cell fitness uh, for that patient. Um, but then, you know, persistence and other things may be better. But allergenic, um, obviously, you have to have a suitable donor to be able to donate. Um, and usually those ones are given post-transplant from you know, the same donor. Um, I think off sh the shelf uh, definitely does have um, an exciting um, opportunity for patients because of um, the removal of those two things is obviously it's readily available. But there's been some exciting um, results, but they, the problem is, is a lot of them don't get taken up and taken to market. And the UCART um, trial um, that was mainly run in Europe is an example of that. Um, so I think they all have a benefit, but obviously they're all in slightly different clinical scenarios. And the problem is, is your patient that's sitting in front of you um, may not fit into the scenario that you have available at the time. So for example, third, you know, um, off the shelf CAR T cells are difficult to get for us in Australia for children. 
I just wanted to add, there's a lot of um, research happening with CRISPR technology, as you know. Um, so that's um, developing at quite a rapid pace. There's a lot of clinical trials um, using CRISPR technology to knock down endogenous TCR. We and others are working on it. So I think um, the future for off-the-shelf CAR T cells is bright. Um, and I think that's where we are headed because then we don't have to depend on the autologous, especially uh, after chemotherapy, uh, getting the T cells. Thank you both. Um, next question. Um, again, I'll probably direct this to Amanda to start with. Um, so how long did it take from preclinical development to clinical trial for the FA2 CAR T cells? And is there a way to speed that up? Um, so for the preclinical development, that was developed by the previous team. I believe it took them about two years. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kavi. Like from the start all the way to the point where they could get the mice models to show that there is um, efficacious uh, treatment effect from the CAR T cells in mice models. Um, and as to how can we speed that up if we can, um, I hate to say this, but we do need more funding. <laughs> funding is really the throttling um, resource in terms of how fast we can get this through. Yeah. Um, so I might um, take the next question, which is from Amy. Um, this is actually a trial design question around the, um, the FA2 trial. So a sample size of nine to 12. Is that going to be sufficient? Is the question. Um, so I might ask you to um, answer that from a trial design perspective. You can answer that one, Carrie. No, I'm not a clinician, but no, <laughs> I, I don't think it's sufficient. But we have to start somewhere. It is a phase one. It is a first in line for uh, pediatric patients. So what we are really trying to do is the primary objective is safety, right? That's a phase one. So I think 12 patients, we had a look um, and Jeff should really be here because um, he sees all the patients at the clinic and we kind of knew that the numbers we could achieve in a three year recruitment window. Um, so I think we were constrained by A, the funding, uh, B, the number of patients and the realistically what our manufacturing capacity is going to be. So I think uh, when you want to look at statistics and if you want to say, well, that is that a sufficient number? Um, uh, probably not, but then that's not the aim of the study. The study is a phase one um, uh, safety study. And also you've got to remember, this is the first time we are doing it in Westmead with a local manufacturing. So it's really a proof of principle to show capacity. And, and one of the other objectives, even the feasibility, right? We, no one has done this from our treated sarcoma children um, who are undergoing all kinds of chemotherapy. So we don't even know if, um, if it's feasible to have good quality CAR T cells. So the kind of objectives that we are looking at in this trial is quite different from a, from a larger um, a two, three, or you know, even a one, two, two A, two B trial. So I think for from that perspective, um, nine to twelve patients is is not bad at all. Is is that all right, Caroline? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it comes down to uh, funding. Um, that's what we have the funding for. It's a phase one study and it's a safety study. If we can demonstrate efficacy in these patients who are at the end of their journey for underlying osteosarcoma, then that would be really great, but it is a safety study. Thanks both. Um, we don't have any more questions in the chat, so feel free people to, to drop them in. Um, I do have a question here about um, the FA2 um, from a within the panel, um, but could people uh, tell us a bit more about what organ function might be adversely affected by the FA2 CAR T cell treatment? Um, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, FA2 expression is quite low on normal cells, but it is expressed on lung epithelium. So you would expect some kind of lung toxicity. However, the, um, the one trial that's uh, been conducted with three patients in glioma um, they did have uh, only, there were only three patients, small trial. So there was a little bit of pulmonary edema and, and, and they did have grade two CRS, 
but they were able to um, overcome that with just dexamethasone. And they did say there was no other toxicity. They didn't have any neurotoxicity or they didn't have any other toxicity. Um, so while yes, um, we are a little concerned that this expression on lung epithelium and there might be some low level expression on other, um, on other tissues, um, there doesn't seem to be any reports so far. Uh, but also the other thing I wanted to mention was the antibody um, that the 4H5 four, four clone that I was mentioning, um, it, it targets a slightly different um, a conformational epitope of the FA2. So we are hoping, uh, or rather there is um, some, some data to suggest that um, the epitope that's on normal cells is slightly different. So you, you wouldn't expect too much toxicity. On and I don't know if you can just mention briefly, I know we're running out of time, is that we haven't talked about safety switch. Yes, we do have a safety switch in our CAR T cells and we can turn it off if um, if we need to, if there's too much toxicity. Again, look, um, on, on behalf of the Cancer Centre, thank you again for a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, we, we've run out of time. Thank you for everyone who, uh, for your excellent questions, probing questions. And for joining us today. A video of this webinar will be available uh, via, webs via our website and the Sydney Children's Hospital Network YouTube channel. There'll also be a short um, survey at the end and I really encourage you please uh, have a moment, fill it out because we'll, we appreciate your feedback. We'll, we will be able to fine tune the excellence with which we present. Uh, thank you again to our panel of experts for a fantastic webinar, uh, to our Q&A facilitators, Laura and Toby, uh, to our contributors, include, including Luminescent Alliance, and most importantly to you, the audience, for your participation. A special thanks to the staff at Sydney Children's Hospital Network who have supported today's presentation impeccably. And, and, and I'd like to hand over now to Laura, who has an amazing and important, crucial announcement. Don't leave. Listen to this announcement. Thank you, Luch. Uh, so today was our final webinar for the year. However, the Sydney Children's Hospitals Network and the Children's Medical Research Institute are proud to announce a, a joint symposia this November the 29th and 30th. The joint symposia are themed Science Meets Healthcare and are hosting discussions of not only the latest scientific developments, but also the clinical counterparts. The free event will be hosted at the Westmead Institute for Medical Research. A detailed program and registration link will be coming soon. We will be joined by local experts as well as international and national leaders, including Professor Jeff Chamberlain, the current president of the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy, and Professor Melissa Little, CEO of the Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Stem Cell Medicine, as they speak about how advanced therapeutics is revolutionizing healthcare. Stay updated by subscribing to the Research Interest Group mailing list using the QR code on the screen, and we look forward to having you join us then. It's goodbye for today. <laughs>